is way too short. I just don't want to read like this. So. Um, I got a word for you guys. Um, there's a story in Exodus 33, and it's Moses having a conversation. And God is telling Moses that he's to lead the people to this land of milk and honey. And Moses says to him, but God, who will lead us? And God is like, Moses. But Moses says to God, he says, unless your presence goes before us, we will not go. And that little tiny conversation between God and Moses is really a picture of our relationship with God. That we can do a lot of things without God, but guess what? We will not accomplish anything without God. See, without a word from God, life is actually very, very messy. We think that, hey, we got this, God. We can do this. I've got my intellect. I've got my ability. I've got my skills. I can do this. But the reality is this, and this is a sobering thought, that you can actually succeed in life and still fail. For example, Steve Jobs is considered one of the great geniuses of our time. He created this wonderful little tiny phone, smartphone, and he's incredible. Yet, in a very strange way, after reading his uh, autobiography, which was 500 pages long, I ended the book in tears because I had realized that this man had actually failed. You see, what happened was he had put the obsession over, uh, of domination and, 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 and being that guy who would invent something. That was his whole purpose in life. But in the end, he had no relationship with his family. Recently, I was listening to, uh, how many know a guy by the name of Dennis Rodman? <laughs> Dennis Rodman, I, I, he res, he's in the Hall of Fame <laughs> for basketball. <laughs> and uh, I, so he, at his acceptance speech, he begins to speak about the very people that helped him accomplish this great accomplishment of becoming a basketball player, a Hall of Famer, recognizes the coaches, he recognizes the, the people that were along the way that helped him. At the end of his speech, in tears, he looks at his two kids and his wife, and he says to them, I just want to tell you that if I had one regret in life, it was, I wish I was a better father. And he was just sobering, he was bawling. And the point is this, guys, is that so many people in life make things that are not important, important. But the things that are really important are the things that actually come from heaven. Unless they come from heaven, they're just temporary things that you will essentially lose. You can't take it with you. And uh, I want to read with you, uh, to you guys a passage. Uh, John just came and took away my notes. And I'm like, well, how am I going to read my notes? John, how am I going to read my notes? Uh, let's read uh, from um, Samuel 3, uh, 1 Samuel 3. Um, and this is uh, just a really quick reading. Um, so let's start here. The Lord called Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I did not call. 
go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And he calls you, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry against Eli everything I spoke against his family. For the time I will carry out against Eli, every t- oh, I read that, from the beginning to the end, for I told him that I will judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for the sacrifice or by sacrifice or offering. Samuel laid down until morning and then opened the doors and the house of the Lord. He was afraid to t- tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was, he, what was it he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord, let him, do, let, let, let him do what is good in his eyes. Then the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as the prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his world. In this passage, we learn that Samuel was ministering to the Lord without understanding or vision, meaning without knowing God. How many of us have a relationship with God but actually don't know God? That's, that's, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. You see, a relationship is very different from having knowledge of something. You know, my kids always say this to me when I ask them to do something. They go, I know. No, you don't. If you knew it, you'd do it. You ever hear that? You have conversations with people, and you're trying to help them, and they're like, I know. No, you don't. If you did, you wouldn't be in the predicament you are right now. You should just sit down and listen until you get it. You don't know what you know until you actually have an encounter, an opportunity to actually experience it. And so for many of us, we have this idea of God based on what people tell us or based on the experiences that we've had. But never have we asked God to reveal himself to us. Because when God reveals himself to you, the game is over. And this is what was happening in Samuel. Samuel was literally in the temple. The dude was already being trained to be this judge, but guess what? He didn't know how to hear. He was deaf, and God was calling him. Samuel, <laughs> Eli, did you call? <laughs> I do that with my wife often. <laughs> Samuel, Eli, did you call? I'm thinking the whole time, where is Eli? He's the, he's the guy. You got to picture this, okay? So in the Old Testament, God spoke through the judges. So Eli is part of the Levites. These are a group of people. They're high priests and their whole job, they're, part, they're the one tribe of Israel, and their whole job is to hear from God and to be spokespersons for God. So there's essentially the word that they speak when they spoke is as if God spoke. So Eli, he's this guy who's also blind and deaf because he doesn't realize what's going on. It's the third time he comes up to, to Samuel and he says, dude, I think it's God who's speaking to you. 
So next time, just say, here I am. Oh, your servant Samuel, I'm listening. I'm listening. And this is so important. So many people say this to me. Joe, God's not speaking. Oh, no, no, no. God's always speaking. You're not listening. The problem is not that God is not speaking. The problem is that we are not listening. We're speaking. We're telling God. How many people pray like this? God, I just want to tell you something. (laughs) You're not doing a good job. (laughs) I just want to give you some ideas how to do this thing because... Dude, things are just messy. So I've got some solutions for you. Here's my list. <laughs> Imagine, you know, you walk into like, I don't know, Prime Minister Trudeau. And you're like, hey, how you doing, dude? Just want to let you know, you know, I think I can help you with some stuff. You know, a couple of things here, just a little here, change here, things will be okay. You know what? The point is this, guys, is that unless we listen, and listening is something, it's a skill. It's a skill that so many of us lack. We do more listening, guess what will happen? We'll have greater revelation and understanding. So this period of time was a very dark time for Israel. Israel was actually under a veil of darkness. Eli, the mediator between Israel and God, was living in a physical and spiritual darkness. His physical blindness was actually a prophetic sign to the nation of its spiritual blindness. But God, this is the beauty of God. God in his mercy does not leave us completely blind. Do you notice the passage? What did it say at the beginning? It says that it wasn't completely dark, that visions were infrequent. So they could have, like, a, you know, sometimes you're in, in the bathroom and it's completely pitch dark or somewhere dark. You don't have to be in the bathroom. That was a really horrible example. <laughs> Who the heck goes in the bathroom and it's pitch dark? Well, sometimes you may do that in the middle of the night. I don't know. But the point is this. You know when you're, like, at the, at the, at the, through the crack of the door, you can see a little light? It's tiny, but it seems so much when it's purely dark. So the point is this, is that God will never actually leave us. Even when we're in sin, when we're completely, utterly, completely like in darkness, in the pit, God is still there. There's still hope. There's still an opportunity. So God was still speaking but the people could hardly hear him. So my first point is this, guys. Where there is no vision or word from the Lord, we find sin. 1 Samuel 2.17, we learned that Eli's sons despised the offering of the Lord. Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Listen to this. It's really important. Okay, So the Levites, the way they were supposed to live was very different. It's a picture, actually, of how our relationship should be. So all the other 11 tribes of Israel, they were given land. They were given everything. They were like, here, that's your land, that's your land, that's your land. But to the tribe of the Levites, God says to them, uh, you know what? I'm not going to give you anything. You're going to live off me. So what was happening was they would actually, the Israelites, so when they gave their offerings, a portion of the offerings would go towards the Levites. But the way the relationship with the Israelites was when they committed sins, they did all this stuff, because they didn't necessarily have that ability to actually interact with God, the way they came to God was they made offerings, peace offerings. They sacrificed. And so what, what the job of the Levites was that their job was there would be meat that was offered to God as a sacrifice, and they were supposed to burn it, but Eli's son were eating it. So they were despising the offering of the Lord. And this was a great, great sin. So what happened is this, is that because they didn't have a relationship with God, because they weren't operating from revelation, because Eli was not able to teach his sons, what was happening was they were operating without a word, without a revelation of who God was. So the most spiritual exercises, the most important things became a ritual that they despised. 
Isn't that for us? Many of us, we have a relationship with God because at the end of the day, we don't go around offering meat offerings to God anymore because Jesus became the final offering. He became the offering. He is the one that was sacrificed on the cross for us. He was basically brought in like a lamb. The Bible tells us that he essentially became our sacrifice. And that is the offering that we're supposed to provide to God. But guess what we do? We despise that very present that God gives us. So we're no different because we don't have a revelation of who Christ is. We don't know who he is. And so when we don't have a relationship, we despise it. So instead of trusting God to provide for them meat as it was the commandment of the Lord, Eli's sons forcibly took the meat that was to be offered to God. This is really important, guys. When there is a lack of vision, a word from God, we rob God of what is rightfully His. Greed and mistrust take hold of our lives when we refuse to give God what belongs to Him. So like Eli's sons, we all have the potential of having religion, the form of religion, and not having the power. And I've done that. We've all lived that way where we have the form on the external sounds great. We look great. We go to church. We do all the things we're supposed to do. But in reality, there is no power. Then the power is released, what? In the place of faith. Because faith, when there's faith, what you're doing is you're agreeing with God. Faith essentially is that, is that I trust you, God. And when we trust God, there is something that happens that is powerful. Power is released from heaven. The only way we can receive from heaven is through faith. God's grace is always here. It's available to all of us. It rains on the unrighteous and the unrighteous. By the way, this is a really important lesson for all of us. Grace is not just for the Christians. Grace is for everyone. Amen. This is so important. Actually, let's look at it this way. Grace is actually needed or necessary more for the guy that's in sin than the guy that is already in relationship with God. That is the story of the prodigal son. The older brother didn't see it. Do you remember? The son comes back and they killed the fattened cat, calf, not the cat, that'd be really bad. <laughs> Maybe in Korea they would do that. But the point is this, is that he brings this great offering. Why? Because his son had come back and his older brother's like jealous. He's like, what do you mean, dude? I've been here all this time serving you. I've been doing the right things. I've been going to church and you don't do anything for me. And this dude, he takes the inheritance and he leaves and he squanders it all. He sleeps with the pigs. That's what he was doing. He came to his senses at that point. He's thinking, man, I should just go to my dad's house. I'm better as a servant there. <laughs> at least they eat. And he was hoping to come back as a servant, but his father receives him as a son. The point is this, guys. It doesn't matter how far you fall off. Once in relationship, always in relationship. You're always a son and a daughter of God. No matter how far you go, God is still waiting for you. And when you come back, he's going to throw the biggest party ever. So grace is actually necessary for that guy and that gal that is in the worst place possible. Because the grace of God says this, it's not based on your behavior. It's not based on your attitude. It's not based on your performance. It's based on my performance and my attitude. And my name is Jesus. And I'm more than capable of handling all your issues. And so God says to you, hey, here it is. God's grace is given to us. God's grace, the definition is what? It's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. We deserve nothing, but God loves us. And so he keeps giving us. That's the heart of the Father. And this is the hardest part is that when you can't hear from God, you make it all about yourself. It's all on you. And the burden is heavy, guys. Because now it's all up to your skill set and your ability. And you begin to do things that you wish you'd never done. You enter, in, I call it, we enter into the realm of trying to do it on our own. When there's a lack of revelation of Jesus as our provider, we try to find confidence in our ability to, th to do things on our own, or we miss out on receiving all the fullness of the blessing. A spiritually blind Christian operates in the form of religion without experiencing the benefits of his relationship. 
Our ability to see is what allows us to receive God's provision for our lives. God has a provision for all of us. God has a blessing for you. But unless you see it, you can't have it. You got to see it. And the only way you can see it is through faith. It's believing and trusting God. That's where you get the word. Proverbs 28, 18 tells us where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained or perish. But happy is the one who keeps the law. When there is a lack of vision or word from the Lord, people cast off all restraint and discipline. Do you want more discipline in your life? Get a word from God. Get a revelation from God. It will change your life. It's no longer about willpower all of a sudden. God sets a standard for your life and you're like, whoa! Whoa! I'm going to quote Nietzsche here, and some of you are going to think I'm crazy, but I want to quote something really important for you. Nietzsche says something really important. And you guys are in church. Nietzsche, he says something before he did. He said this. He said, if you have a strong enough why, you'll go through anyhow. Do you hear that? If you have a why that is strong enough, You'll go through any how. The how is no longer important. You're not going to come to God and say, Oh God, but it's so hard. It's so difficult. It's so challenging because you understand the why. When you understand the why for the life that you're living today, all the hows will be answered. The hows are never answered by just you looking at them going, Why God? How God? Why that? No, no. The how becomes an exciting thing to do. All of a sudden you're like, Oh wow, I must gladly boast in my weakness. You get a revelation of the why that you're here. And the point is this, is that so many of us, I'm reading a book right now called The Meaning of Life. It was written by a man that was in the concentration camps during Nazi Germany. Great uh, psychologist. I can't remember his name. But there you go. Thank you. It's well read. The book's been read by millions of people. And the whole book is about the meaning of life. And this is a simple answer for the meaning of life. He says basically this that you have to understand, like suffering, let's not get all excited about suffering. Suffering, there's nothing good about suffering. If you are like looking to suffer in life, you're a masochist and that's not healthy. God's heart is not for us to suffer. But what he says in the book, and it's very biblical, is this, is that what we do with suffering is it's, it's how we respond to it that matters. So in the moment of your pain, in the moment of your suffering, what you got to do is you got to give meaning to your suffering by looking at the purpose of the suffering. So if you're ill right now and you're going through a lot of pain, you got to ask God and say, okay, God, I don't like this. I hate this. But what's the point of this? What are you trying to do through this process? And guess what? Some of the greatest opportunities come presented in pain. They, they're presented to us in challenges. They come in a form that we're like, no, I don't want nothing to do to it. But that's the window of opportunity often. Do you see how many great people like Terry Fox Terry Fox, the man that we still celebrate. Kids run all over in September. They'll start running again all over Canada. In the moment of his pain and his suffering, he said, I'm going to give purpose to my pain. I'm going to raise money so I can help others. Do you get it, guys? It's not just about you. It's about others. You're going through stuff and you think, God, what's wrong? Devil wants to isolate you, make you think you're all alone. But no, God raised you in community. There's purpose to your life. No matter how whacked out it looks like right now, how difficult and challenging it looks like, not even understand what's going on. God is saying, yes, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. He's painting a masterpiece and you just can't see it. Number two, when we can't see the way we view God and people is distorted. Do you have sometimes issues where you're walking around and you're thinking people are out to get you? You think God is out to get you? The reason being is because you just don't have a perspective that is right. The reason why we lack discipline, courage, and struggle with sin is because we cannot see. The way we see is impaired. Like Eli, we're spiritually impaired in our revelation. If our vision is impaired, we can't see properly, and the way we view God and people is distorted. 
Matthew 6, 22, 24 from the voice says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. You draw light into your body through your eyes and light shines out, of, out to the world through your eyes. So if your eye is well and shows you what is true, then your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eyes clouded or evil, then your body will be filled with evil and dark clouds. And the darkness that takes over the body of a child of God who's gone astray that is the deepest darkness, darkest darkness there is. Our eyes are the windows of our heart. Meaning, we perceive through our eyes, but we see through our hearts. So many of us, and this I see this so often. You know, guys struggle with pornography and they tell them to bounce their eyes. <laughs> Meaning, like, you know, don't say fix on the girl and just keep looking. What a horrible way to live. Imagine walking around all day. That's not God's heart. What God wants to do is this. He changes you on the heart so that what you see changes. The problem with Eli wasn't his physical blindness. It was his heart that was the problem. Eli and his sons despised the power given to them by God, and they were incapable of trusting God. If we begin to trust God in our hearts, the way we see the world will change completely. Do you want a miracle in your life today? Do you want the solution to all your problems? Simple. Get a word from God. Get a word from God. Do not wake up. Do not move into your day. Just like Moses refused to say to God, I will not go unless you go before me, unless you give me the, the direction. Because he is. You know that song, that I word is a light unto my path and a lamp Onto whatever, I've screwed that up pretty badly now. <laughs> My brain, I've had six concussions. I think I just had a seventh one right now as we spoke. <laughs> and a light onto my path. And a light. Well, there you go. Like Amy Grant sang it. I should have known that. That's one of my favorite all time artists. Lie. Uh, <laughs> Listen to this, guys. Eli and his house were judged by God because he refused to hear the word of the Lord. Just refused. He decided to do it by himself. And this is really sad because that's not God's heart and that's not God's intention. 1 Samuel 3.13 says, And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. You see, what happens is this, is that when we lack revelation from God, we can't even restrain people. We just let people do whatever that they want. When you don't have vision for your life, when you don't have a word for God for your life, you can't lead anybody. You can't take anybody anywhere. Moses was able to lead the people of Israel because he actually had a relationship with God. And it was out of that relationship he was able to take them because God told him exactly what he was doing. Life is a lot easier with God than on our own. We think, it, we, we, think we know best. But I want to encourage you guys today that if you try to live life on your own, you're going to totally shipwreck it. You're going to destroy your life. And I know many of us are here and we've tried it on our own. We finally surrendered to God and we said we can't do this anymore. You know, the judgments of God is just the consequence of us refusing to listen. We simply listen. Things would change. And I want to encourage you. Listening to God doesn't mean life will be easy. God may ask you to go through some stuff that you may not necessarily want to go through. But you have to trust Him. Because God says to you, I will go with you. I will go with you. You think it was easy for the Israelites to take over that land that God had promised them? They had to go through some giants. They had to do some fighting. But God said to them, I will go before you. And funny enough, if you read Joshua 5, the Israelites are about, like they've done their 40 years. It should have took them 12 days, but it took them 40 years to get to, the, to that promised land. And when they're finally at, about to arrive and about to take Jericho, there's a, there's, it's a powerful passage because in that passage it says that when the Edomites and all these people on the other side had heard about what God had done for the Israelites that they had walked across dry land. You know, that he separated the seas, done all this. They had heard all of the miracles. It said they had no fight in them. 
Do you know that they had no fight in them? So God was calling them to enter into a fight that they had already won. Mike Tyson is one of my all-time favorite boxing guys, even though he's crazy. I love him. But Mike's thing is this, that say this, he says, majority of the fighters had lost the fight long before he'd ever entered the ring. The battle was won in the mind. They were so intimidated by Mike that by the time he was in the ring, they were ready to fall. 90% of the fight was actually here, and 10% of it was simply him showing up. What I'm telling you is this, there are some battles in front of you right now. There's some things that God has called you into, and you're thinking to yourself, how am I going to do this, God? This is impossible. And God says to you, dude, you got a word. I went ahead of you already. I just want you to keep following me and keep trusting me, and you watch. Some giants are going to fall. There's some giants that are going to fall tonight. God wants to kill the giants in your life, and the only way he can kill them is through a word. One word from God changes everything. One of the greatest mentoring lessons I ever learned in my life was to get a word from God. Years ago, my wife and I were living in Vanier in this tiny little home, and we just had our first child, and there was mold all over the house, and, and, and it was impossible. We didn't have the financial means to get out from where we were at. We were, we were just there, and we just assumed we were going to be there. And I went to a, 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 a mentor of mine, and, and I told him the story, and the, the mentor came up to me, and he said, Joe, go get a word. Go get a word. So I got down on my knees and I said, babe, we need a word from God. And we began to pray and God said this to me. And I don't know why he said it, but he said, I'm going to give you a home without a mortgage. And I thought, I like this word. So guess what I did? <laughs> guess what I did? You think I just sat on that word? No, I picked up the phone and I called the real estate agent. Did I have the money? No, I didn't even have the credit. <laughs> I didn't have the credit, but I picked up that phone, called the real estate agent. Make sure when you call a real estate agent that they're Christian or that they believe in stuff because they think you're crazy. So I called this Holy Spirit filled and I told them, I said, hey, I, 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 I need to go look at some houses. And he said, do you have money? No. Can you get a loan? No. But I got a word. I got a word. He said, you got a word? Yeah, I got a word. Okay, you got a word that I'm going to come visit you. And we met and, we, and he said, okay, here are the houses that we're going to look. And so we went and we began looking for houses. I had no idea what was going on. It was a Monday and on a Thursday I get a call from my sister. And she says, hey, how you doing? I'm good and this and that. And she says, I've been thinking of buying a property in Ottawa. I want to buy an investment. I'm in Toronto. I want you guys to have it. I was like, Really? I had a word. Of course. I had a word. So God's going to do something about it. He will never let his word go void. It says that it will never return void. So if you've got a word from God, guess what? You're set. I don't know when, but I know God's word will always come to fruition. And so I ended up purchasing a home without a mortgage. Yeah. Without a mortgage. Without a mortgage. Seven years later, we're praying and we feel God's calling us for more. My wife, when she gets like angst, she can't take it anymore. The kitchen is too small. She's got too much of a vision. She wants land. She's got big vision. We've got massive vision. We want a farm. We're like, God, we want this. Oh, we love what we've got, but we want this. And my wife has been stored in it. You know, she runs children's garden and all that stuff. We've been living in it, but we just felt there was a desire in the heart for more. And I don't know where it came from, but it was God. It wasn't that we weren't satisfied. It was just from God. And so we started praying. Started praying. And we tried to do it by ourselves. It didn't work. It didn't work. It became frustrating. It got angry. And so finally we said, God, we surrendered. We said, we're set. We're going to be here for the next three years. We'll, we'll, we'll plan that out. In three years, we'll move out to something bigger. I get a call. Guess who called me again? My sister. And she's like, hey, you know that property that mom and dad, are, you've been helping them to try to sell it? Yeah? Well, why don't you guys take it? What? Well, it's the same amount of money that you're currently paying. What? For the big, massive house? Yeah? Yeah, you can have it. Do you want it? 
Oh, yeah, I have a word. Yeah! <laughs> so we're going to start moving June 1st without a mortgage. What am I trying to do? I'm not trying to make it look like I'm, I'm super whatever. Everything in my life, whether it's my wife, whether it's my entire life, that rhymed, that's why I said it, has <laughs> all been not because I planned it, not because I did things right, but because God's word. I'm telling you, each one of you has a word over your life. You have a destiny and a purpose. I just feel like I want to prophesy. Can you get, stand up for a second, Gareth? I just feel like, Gareth, something God wants to do, something more than you even imagine. I know you've got the skill and the talent, but God says to you this. He says, you don't see it right now. And I know you're going through this season of, 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 of training and, and you're wondering, like, God, like, I've been in this a long time. What are you doing? And God says to you, I've been planning something bigger. It wasn't about fame. It wasn't just about the music. It's about income. And God is about to do something through your music that's going to astound you. It's much bigger. It's much bigger than what you can handle. And I feel like God is surrounding you with the right people people in the season. Right alliances for the new season. He's bringing the right people because God says that there is a call over both of you in your life. There's something that is so much more bigger. And God says, expect more. When you think you've dreamt big, he says, dream even greater because there is something astounding that's going to happen through your life. I don't know. I didn't mean to prophesy. I just felt like a prophesy. So, I've been, I've preached way too long, so I'm going to leave. <laughs> My question is this to you guys. How is your vision? What do you see? I want you to go home and I want you to get on your knees today. And I just want you to pray and ask God and say, God, give me a word. Give me a word. What is the word of my life? What is it that you want? And I'm telling you, God will speak and then do everything that you can to align yourself to make sure that word comes to pass. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be confrontations. There's going to be lies. But you got to keep going. Bring someone else and tell them about it. And begin the process of cultivating that word of your life. And you will get used to receiving words for a season. God will give you word. There are big words for your life. God will give you really simple words for today. God will always speak to you. But get used to waking up every morning and say, God, what are you saying? What are you saying? Do, I, do you want to, yes, you got, you got a word? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's a word. Hey, if you got a word, say something. Like, I mean, service is over right now. I'm not going to try to continue. I've talked enough already. I just want to say thank you guys. But I really believe each one of you is special in God's eyes. And God has something for you much bigger than the life that you're living right now. It's not about you. It's about him. But it's still about you too in a weird way. Anyways, God, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for what you've done in our lives and what you continue to do. And I pray today for each person that they would see things from your perspective and your vantage point. And I pray, Father, that you would give them dreams and revelations and insights in this Standing here that you would speak to them specifically, Lord, in a grace so relentless So I bless them in the name of Jesus. By perfect love